Tally Hairston is the director of the John M. Perkins Center at Seattle Pacific University. For 18 years, Tally has ministered to at-risk and church youth. For the last 10 years, he has trained, consulted, and led reconciliation and community development initiatives nationally and internationally. Tally is also board president for a systematic healing nonprofit uh, organization called Xmender. That's right. And he is the NGO and consultant for the Global Rebuild Corporation. He also hails from Seattle, Washington. Uh, put your hands together and welcome him as he ascends the pulpit. Where, where are the young people who served this conference? You wore blue t-shirts all the time. Stand up. Stand up. Don't get shy. Stand up. You got us coffee. You got us tea. You got us whatever we needed. Where are you? Raise your hands so we can see you. And I want everyone in this house to give them a big hand. Come on. Come on. Give them a big hand. They, they did registration. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You made our trip wonderful by your presence and by your service. Uh, it is an honor to be here uh, in Jamaica for the first time. Uh, I want to stay longer because I love the accent. <laughs> it's not fair that I can't have an accent. Uh, <laughs> that I do. <laughs> I'm so glad to be here. Uh, what, this has been an amazing week. If you have learned something that challenged you, that spoke to your spirit, I want you to raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. That's amazing. Uh, and I'm sorry. Now, this is, a, this is for young people tonight, right? Okay, so what I'm, I'm going to need the young people to do uh, and I do this at home, so don't, don't be mad. Um, young people, turn to the young person closest to you and ask them this question. If you came to see me, I'm sorry. <laughs> ask them, did they, come get, did, did they come looking for a hookup? Oops. Oops, did he say that? Tell him wrong place, wrong time. Uh-huh. See, that's cold, young people. We just spoke cold. Your parents didn't even know what he was talking about right there. They just hook up. What's that? Uh. I'm going to be good. Um, my boss is here, Dr. John Perkins. <laughs> I'm going to be good. Uh, I, everywhere I go and have the chance to... Uh, speak to young people. Uh, I thank three people, my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, my parents, and Dr. John Perkins. This man has challenged me over the last 10 years to live beyond what I could ever imagine. And then he turned around and called me friend. Yeah, I know. Messed me up too. I was all messed up. Uh, and I can tell you that very few people live in such a way that I want to follow them. As a preacher's kid growing up in the church, I can tell you I learned a lot that I didn't want to be like. But having the chance to walk with John Perkins at 81 years old and to being able to see him wake up in the morning and do Bible studies and discipline himself to pray and to rest and to respect family and to honor the God in him has really transformed and changed my life. And the reason I say that is not because he's here. But the reason I say that is because in a fatherless generation, and we, heard, we learned something, didn't we, this week, didn't we, about fatherlessness. In a fatherless world, in a fatherless community, in a fatherless generation, Really, those who struggle are the children. 
it's not, uh, when, let's look, look at it this way. When you look at all of the major statistics, gangs, literacy, high pregnancy rates of, of children, incarceration rates, you look at every major statistic. That goes to the quality of life. I'll just use this one. I'll just... That goes to the quality of life. And related to fatherlessness, children suffer. We have this afternoon grieved as a community, listening to the struggle of children. Abused children, misdirected children, misguided children, abandoned children. And this is uh, something we should be broken about. It is, it is hard for me to understand how we can just go out after hearing so much pain. When the church, I'm not talking about your church, <laughs> not your church, but when the church has decided to put a band-aid on cancer, that won't work. But let me tell you something, whenever you come to a place when you realize that fatherlessness can create a curse upon children. Then when God sends a word in the church, like he did the other day, that says that he's returning fathers and men back to the church, back to their families, and back to the community, then you've got to rejoice because if fatherlessness is a curse, then to have a father is a blessing. Somebody ought to say amen right there. Now, I come from the place where you have to talk back to me. Someone asked me if I'm going to uh, lecture. Uh, if you have a notebook, you might want to put it away. Uh, we're going to have church. <laughs> I grew up listening to a woman out of Jamaica, West Indies, Jackie McCullough. Uh-oh. Yes. Young people don't know Jackie. I don't know if they know Jackie McCullough. She was good friends with my mother, and I grew up as a 9, 10, 12-year-old listening to this Jamaican, West Indies preacher who transformed Pentecostalism in the United States and has served over 15,000 people with medical missions from her ministry. And then I grew up listening to a Spanish town, thin, tall, lanky. He was about 25 when I first heard him. Noel Jones, growing up as friends of my father, growing up listening to this Spanish town Jamaican preach himself silly and is transformed and is considered one of the most foremost intellectuals in the United States regarding theology and church. So I've been influenced by Jamaica. My God, have I been influenced by Jamaica. I did this thing where I put on Facebook that I was going to Jamaica and all my Jamaican friends started hitting me up with emails. Like, where are you going? Why are you going to Jamaica? You left us out. So I started Facebooking back to them while we was having church and stuff and doing the service and and uh, <laughs> I may be coming back with some friends <laughs> next time. Because I did not realize how many of my family, my friends, were influenced by people who had come from Jamaica, who had been influenced by the Jamaican struggle, by the Jamaican people, by the Jamaican life and culture. Sometimes when you live in a place, you don't see. And it takes an outsider sometimes to come in and tell you how great you are. 
particularly young people who come from abused backgrounds, it takes a lot sometimes to think of yourself as something or somebody. And the church can tell us time and time again how great we are, but then we struggle because our experiences don't say that. Okay, let me make sure I get all the intellectuals covered. Leading change comes from a book by John Cotter. John Cotter describes eight principles of change. Of all the eight principles, building a core group, creating a shared vision and strategy, empowering others to act, creating small successes, recognizing successive changes, successful changes, reproducing those changes, and then institutionalizing these changes, there's one that caught my eye that has to do with young people. Urgency. This leading business scholar writing for the world says this, if you want to lead change, you've got to be desperate. You've got to have a sense of urgency. And what I want to, you to want to share with you today is the story of an individual, a young lady, an orphan, beautiful orphan girl, foreigner, named Esther. Esther is this very attractive young lady who actually doesn't have parents. She's an orphan. Her cousin adopts her. Her name is actually Hadassah. Hadassah, orphaned, picked up by her cousin, and then moved to Persia. There's nothing like that in our experience today. I tried to come up with an example which you can relate to young people and it's not. It's maybe like Lil Wayne going to Harvard. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, like, it's like me trying to go to a reggae club and dance. I, I, I can't make it. I can't swing it. I, it's, it's, there's just no example that we could come up with to help you understand how a young lady can end up in Persia as an orphan with her cousin. There's no way I can translate that to you. This is what I know, though, about her experience. And that is that if God is going to send a father into the land again, and there's a blessing now coming where there was a curse before. Then young people, you've got to get into position. Because there's a blessing coming with healthy fathers on the rise. I believe what God said so much last night, I'm acting like it's already happening. I believe that this, these, these fathers are becoming, are going to be discipled and men are going to start to walk in God's call for their lives and programs are going to start to fill in the gap and men are going to become passionate about leading again in a godly way. I'm so convinced that I came tonight all the way from Seattle to tell you young people, get into position. Get into place. Get into position. Watch this. This young lady, name is Hadassah. There are three things you've got to understand that God does when he wants to get you into position, young people. The first thing he did was he changed her identity. He changed her name from Hadassah to Esther. Esther meaning morning star. 
Mm. You see, whenever God wants to change your purpose, he first changes your identity. And young people, you used to identify with certain things, but I came to tell you that when you get into position, God has to change your identity because your purpose is changing. I know, and see, this is, once again, young people who have gone through things, this is our challenge. And I understand this. Believe me, I do. Seeing ourselves as abused, seeing us as victims, seeing ourselves as depressed, seeing ourselves as volatile or hurting. I know the reason. Oh, Jesus, I know the reason we sleep around is because we're hurting. Oh, it's going to get hard in here. I know the reason that you're, you're, you're abandoning your family is because you're hurting. I know the reason you're scared to talk about Jesus is because you know you failed him. I know you come into church and you worship like an angel, but inside you're in pain. I know at night when no one's looking and you're mad that the boy turned you away again and that you've been looking for love in all the wrong places. I don't come to condemn you. I come to say, I understand. Jesus understands. Many times in our culture, uh, we teach each other to be so strong that when we become weak and we're hurting and we're wounded, really it's just a shell on the outside that makes people think that everything's okay. But really on the inside, we're hurting. And we have a tough time talking about our own pain and then it comes out in rage and anger on some teacher. It comes out in anger and rage at family. It comes out as anger and rage to somebody you don't even know down the street. And as much as we would like to say we have good church, we walk in hurting and we leave hurting. We walk in 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 pain and we leave in pain and yet the young people who have no identity that they can say I know who I am I came to share with you that you're not your abuse you're not your pain you may have gone through that, but that's not you. Uh, you're not your failure. I know you failed, but it's not you. You're not your failure. Yes, you failed, but that's not you. There needs to be a correction of who you are first before you get into position Literally, young people, you won't get into position for God to do amazing things in your life until you know who you are. And the pain and the struggles and the anger and the rage and the depression and the fear, the, 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 the simple anger at not having somebody there to protect you at night. Busy parents, parents who stick you in front of an Xbox or a video game, parents who barely hug you, parents where you don't even know where they are most of the time. That anger, that frustration that is broiling on the inside of you, that's not you. 
That's not who you are. I came to say that you are more than that. You are so much more than that. There is so much more to you than what, you str- what you're struggling with. And when you get in church, the church has the audacity to condemn you for your struggle, but has no power to help you get out of what you're in. Because church has to only go an hour. And if you cry out to God and told the truth about what you're really going through, somebody would put you out of the church. Mm. When's the last time you had a good, good R-rated testimony service? Where somebody told the truth about what they're struggling with. The Bible says Esther chapter 2, and he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, who Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. God wants to change your identity. The next thing God wants to do, Esther chapter 4 verse 13 reads like this. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. Mordecai had convinced Esther to win uh, the beauty pageant. She wins the beauty pageant, but that wasn't the reason she was there. Esther toward Mordecai of a plot. And Esther and Mordecai began to uh, develop a strategy for dealing with the execution of the Jews, their community. Mind you, the king had no idea that Esther was a Jew. She did not divulge her identity to the king. Esther in chapter 4 and Mordecai began to discuss a plan. Esther thinking that, hey, I won the beauty pageant and I'm an orphan and I look good. That's pretty good. That's the end of the story. The book should have ended right there. Esther's like, stop the the movie. The movie of my life is pretty good right now. I live in the king's palace. I get my hair done, my nails done. Ladies, don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. She gets the spa treatment every day. All the young ladies look at her because she won. Come on, sisters, you all are way too quiet right now. Uh Uh-huh, young ladies, don't you? You'd be working hard to keep them in straight right there. (laughs) Esther had no problem keeping her in straight. She had somebody every day to keep them straight. Homegirl didn't need a weave. Didn't need one. Didn't need fake fingernails, fake toenails. She didn't need none of that. They groomed them every day. They cut her cuticles. They did it all. They made her smell so good. And then her her cousin comes back to her and says, well, wait a minute. (laughs) You got some more work to do. Oh, wait a minute. No, I don't. I got a big wardrobe. I'm chilling with the king of Persia. Hello. Don't act like you would have been like telling Cousin Mordecai, hey, you better go back out there and do what you was doing. You got me in the kit. I won the beauty pageant. I'm cool. Don't act like you would have been like, go back to the king and what? Tell him what? About who? Wait, wait, there's a party going on at the king's palace next week. (laughs) I'll tell him after that. (laughs) Can I at least, you know, um, cousin Mordecai? Can I at least get get a get a guy first? You know, can I can I find my husband first? You know, let me, you know, maybe one of the servants wants to take me out while the king's not looking. You know how we are. The minute you get something, you're gone. All of my college graduate students are looking at me like, don't say a word. Don't talk about how we plan to leave Jamaica as soon as we get a good job. 60% doctors, lawyers, professionals leave Jamaica. I 
Esther had the chance to leave. Leave her people. They did not know who she was. You know how you go when you get your, your college degree, you know. Yeah. And when we got them here, don't y'all know, you, you bright, smart students are in here, and you're like, I'm going to act, I'm going to lose the accent, I'm going to move. I'm going to leave all of this behind, all of this pain, all of this suffering. I'm going to work in New York. I'm going to go fashion nuts. That's right. I know. We, I done talked to y'all. I, I, I ain't lying. This is the truth. Esther had a chance to do the same thing. Listen to what Esther and Mordecai say. Esther says, and Mordecai says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace this time, then shall there an enlargement and a deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house shall be destroyed. And who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. Mm. This is what we call in theology a kairos moment. Yes, a Kairos moment. Uh, it's not chronological time. It's not like, well, and the first part of that, chapter 13, is chronological. If you don't do it now, somebody will do it later. This last part of that verse is a Kairos moment. It's Kairos time for such a time as this. See, young people, you've come to Jamaica, to this city, to this place, to this location, to this church, tonight for such a time as this. It is time to get into position. Know your identity, number one. Number two, know your purpose. Esther is told by Mordecai, your purpose wasn't to be beautiful in front of the king and sashay back and forth. Your purpose was to save your people. Your purpose was to save your people. Don't think, as we saw last night with my brother from Trenchtown who had been shot seven times, don't think that the seventh bullet didn't work so you could go back to doing what you were doing. He saved you for such a time as this. Don't think, my brother, Ezra, you went from, from ganja to Jesus. That's what you told. So in four years, you could maybe get, no, for such a time as this. Your purpose is to save your people. Esther had to get over the fact that it was about her. And I know young people, we treat you in the church like the church is all about you. We want you to come to church for you so you can be better. And then we don't give you anything to do. And we have you sit there all day. And then when you get mad and leave, we act like something wrong with you. I'm not talking about this church. I'm not talking about your church, the other church. Notice this, Esther had to come to the place where she realized her purpose wasn't about herself. God is not taking you through what he's taking you through so you could feel good about you. I know that's the first step, but the second step is his purpose for you is for somebody else. I, I was going through something so painful. I literally cried every day for two years. Literally cried every day for two years. And I got to church and I was preaching or something. And afterwards, this woman came up to me and she said, I've been watching you. I mean, I just, can I, and I'm just going to be real. She said, I've been watching you. I know what you're going through. She said, but the way you went through it, Bless me. I was like, honey, that was hard. I cried almost every day. I needed a therapist, a counselor, some, 
some pain pills. I needed a worship service. I needed 40 phone calls a day. I was going through. Now, everybody in here looking at me like, Jesus, like you ain't never gone through nothing. <laughs> she said, I've been watching you go through, and it encouraged me not to give up because of what I was going through. You see, you've got to understand that your purpose is not about you. It's for somebody who's watching you. <laughs> Young people. Your purpose isn't about you. It's about somebody who's watching you. And the things you go through and the things that you, that God raises up in you in terms of your purpose, it's going to, it's all about getting you into position for the third movement of God, which is he gives you vision or destiny. Ah. Oh. Have you ever been with somebody who acted like uh, all they could see was three feet in front of them? Um, I've driven with some people like that. Uh, young people, you've got to understand uh, that the third movement that God sends you through to get you in position is he takes someone like a Mordecai and partners you together in a mentoring relationship. That's what Mordecai was. He became a mentor to Esther. She told him, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to see the king. When things got bad, he went out to the market area and began to cry and lament ripped his clothes, embarrassing Esther. Mordecai comes to the gate. Esther says, what are you doing? You're making me look bad. Take these clothes. He says, no. There's still a plan by a man named Haman to destroy our community. They begin to concoct the next level of their plan Watch, and I love how God does this. You can read all of Esther, the book of Esther. You get to chapter 10, which is the shortest chapter in all of the book of Esther. And it's there in chapter 10 that you actually learn what the whole purpose of the book was written for. Many times we stop at Esther's identity or we stop at Esther's purpose. The power of this text comes in chapter number 10 where it says in the very last verse, for Mordecai the Jew was next unto King Hazarus and great among the Jews and accepted of the multitude of his brethren, seeking the wealth of his people and speaking peace to all of his seed. Not Esther, Mordecai. Destiny, young people, God gives you vision. God gives you when you begin to partner with a mentor, a discipler, someone in your life who can see what God is doing in you and begin to speak and affirm your identity and your purpose. And then they start to help you realize something about you. That is that God is using you bigger than what you thought he was. I want you young people to understand something. I think your vision is too small. I'm going to offend some, and I'm sorry. But your vision is too small. You are just satisfied with making it. Your vision is too small. I don't, I don't, I don't mean to hurt your feelings, young people, but just getting by isn't destiny. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. 
turn to the one next to you and ask them, and you just won't get by. Uh huh. Uh huh. You just want to get by. Just want to make it. You know, if I can just get 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 through high school, if I can just, if I if I well, I, I get through college, just get a good job, I'll be you know. Man, if I can just find me a man, if I can just find me a woman, I'll be good, you know. Man, if I can just give me a car, just get some rims. Man, if I can just give me some new Nikes, man, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Man, if I can be popular, oh, God, I'm just good. I'm just good. Young people, you know how we think. Don't act like I'm not telling the truth. Oh, man, if I can just be accepted at school tomorrow. Oh, if I can just, if I can just pass this test. I hate to tell you this, but your vision is too small. You need to start studying like you can write the test. Oh, don't, no, no, no. And and, and I'll tell you personally how God did this in my life. I, um, here I am, this is young kid, and I was at the bookstore at some church thing, and, and there's this big book in theology, and God said, buy it. Ten dollars. Buy it. I said, why? I can't read nothing in there. He said, I didn't ask you what you could do now. Oh, Jesus. Your vision is too small. I started reading what I didn't understand until I understood it. Woo! My God. Woo! Uh Uh-huh. Your vision is too small. You keep asking for one when you need to ask for ten. Your vision's too small. You keep figuring out just how you're going to get a man. You need to figure out how you're going to have a family and travel the world and tell everybody about what God can do. Your vision's too small. Mm Mm-hmm. You keep thinking about just having a business, and God said, I want to have you. You need a corporation to save Jamaica. You're going to need two or three corporations in every church. You keep talking about saving a few young people and God's talking about saving a generation. Uh Uh-huh. You keep talking about, if I can just get my hair done, you need to realize God wants you to own a salon. So so, That's right. Oh, Lord, have mercy, Lord Jesus. We keep thinking our vision's too small. We keep thinking, I told the young men last night, stop thinking in terms of I'm just going to make it through tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. What you need to be start thinking is, God, I got a future. Wasn't it the scriptures that said, I know the plans. Plans to prosper. If you believe that, then why do you keep thinking about young people? Now, why do we keep thinking so small when the God of the universe created you to change the world? Well, it's just Jamaica. I was born in Kingston in Spanish town. You're thinking too small. Why can't the world, if they come to Jamaica, to fornicate? Why can't the Christian community have a vision for Jamaica that doesn't just include singing the national anthem, but includes all people from around the world coming to worship the God of Jamaica? Who said it couldn't be done? What doubting devil said it couldn't be done? Who said you couldn't lay out a 10-year plan to no longer be the murder capital of the world? Who said? Who said you couldn't over 10 years track the decline, the declining rate of promiscuity in your country. Who said you couldn't do it? Who said you couldn't be the prayer capital of the Caribbean? By God from glory. Who said you couldn't do it? Who said you couldn't send young people all over the world as a witness for Jesus Christ? Who said 
You, you have to be the place where nonprofits come to take pictures of poor kids. Who said you have to be that place? My God, your vision is too small. Young people get into position. God is sending a blessing. And when change comes, all of you who went back to cooking jerk chicken, going from Sunday to Sunday, acting like everything's all right, while the rest of us said, no way. Mm -mm. The next generation of young people to come out of this country will be responsible for a radical change in the way we live and how we are known. They need to change the billboards. They need to change the marketing for this city and for this country. They're going to have to change how they shoot movies about you. They're going to have to change how they talk about you. They're going to have to change how they, they publicize this community. They're going to have to change it because when God opens up his windows, a blessing. When God opens up your eyes. When God takes wounded, broken children and makes them in the, Lord have mercy, makes them queens and kings. Corporate executives, lawyers and doctors, healthy mothers who love not only the children in their house, but children all over the village. Healthy fathers who take in kids that they don't even know. Come on, eat at my house. Come on, come fishing with me. Kids that nobody wants. This generation of young people learns how to pick them up. Shake them in the face. Look at them in the face and shake them and say, no, you ain't a punk. You ain't a G. You ain't a homeboy. You God's child. Uh, I'm done. I'm going to tell you this story. Uh, I come out of a middle class home. Preacher's kid. Uh, if, we, if we even thought about listening to music that wasn't Christian, Somewhere somebody slapped us from around the room. We wouldn't even think about it. We had to hide to dance. We'd be in the corner. We'd wait for our parents to go to bed, and we'd turn the radio, the clock radio, to the, to the, to the, 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 the R&B station, the hip-hop station. And we'd be listening to it like, ooh, we being sneaky. My mom was so spiritual, she'd wake up in the middle of the night, who's, who's playing music that shouldn't be playing? She was so anointed, she could hear. <laughs> I decided, I ain't lying, I'm not lying, I'm not lying. I, was, I kid you not, I was on Facebook this, uh, the other afternoon, and I was kidding with some friends about Jamaican rum. My mom Facebook, oh, for everybody to see, she said, you are there to work. I said, yes, ma'am. I come from an anointed mother and an anointed father. I decided in the fifth grade I was going to cuss and be and fuss and fight. They pulled me aside without ever hearing a word from a teacher. No one called home. No friend said I was doing anything. My parents pulled me aside and said, the spirit of the Lord has told me. I said, gee. Can a brother, I'm in the fifth grade, can a brother just have some fun? I mean, it's not like I'm going to do much. Jesus. I, I, I come from a middle class family. I'm telling you, spiritual church going. I went to church Tuesday for Bible study, Wednesday for youth service, Friday for saints meeting, Saturday to clean up the church, and Sunday, Sunday school, 11 o'clock service and 6 o'clock service. My friends didn't know who I was unless I was at school. 
They're like, we don't never see you out. Never. I said, you ain't never. I just, church. That's all I know. I sleep in the pew. Do my homework in the pew. I got so used to church, I didn't even know what home was like. Where, where, where do we live, Ma? Because we always at the church. That's how I grew up. So fast forward, God calls me into street ministry with thugs, hoods. And my first trip to the hardest, one of the hardest schools in our city, I got out my car, dude yelled out the window, hey, you blank, blank square. I got back in the car, closed the door, and drove away. I said, oh, that's the devil. It's time to go. I'm not lying. I'm not lying. Until one day God got a hold of me and said, for such a time as this, I've given you a purpose. And it's to reach these kind of folks. I said, but God, I can't do it. I'm, I'm nerdy. I said, I'm cute on most days, God. But I'm nerdy. I play sports so I can look athletic. But I can't dance to save my life. I ain't got no swag. None at all. No swag. I, can't, I didn't even know how to wear a hat until my son told me how. He's like, you got to wear it. Like, I was like, oh, Jesus. I said, I can't do it. He said, your vision's too small. I've called you for such a time as this. I said, God, but I'm a sexually abused child. Someone in the church messed me up. God said, that's not your name. He said, my name for you is beautiful. He said, you're no longer a victim. You're a victor. One day, after preaching a youth service, two twins came up to me and said, we want you to meet our brother. He's, has a, federal, he's a federal menace to society at 16. 16. A minister labeled by the federal government as a minister to society. At 16, come out of Chicago, black gangster disciples, moved to Seattle. Had turned Seattle in one summer into a hotbed of gang violence. And they come to little old me and say, come meet our brother. I went to meet that young man. Scared out my mind to a neighborhood I ain't never been before. My parents wouldn't let me go in that neighborhood. Never been to a neighborhood like that. Radically, God was right. This young man started to call me dad. His mom, when I would come to the house, would say, your son is ready for you. This one young man became responsible for the largest school in our city turning around when 20 young men came to an outreach camp with me. I didn't know, I didn't know what I was doing. Like 20 of them came with me. And the young kid, uh, his, name is, his, his street name was K.O. Because he said, I never need a gun. In one punch, I can knock anybody out. K.O., in the middle of the outreach camp, on the very last night, where all he's been doing for four days is pulling girls' numbers and staying out all night. This young man would make three, four hundred dollars a night on a weekend and not sleep for three days. He made so much money that when the gangs started shooting and shot one of his boys, he became solely responsible for putting out the hit on the guy that was supposed to be killed. He's sitting in a camp way out in the middle of nowhere with a middle class, no swag having young cat like myself, calling me dad. All the young people after the service was over got up and left. K.O. stayed in the floor. All his buddies, all his homies, all his guys got up and walked out. He didn't move. K.O. had never known his father, been abused by young men who were coming to the home with the mom. He watched his mom sell, uh, get drugs from his friends. 
smoke it till she was high, and then run around yelling at everybody half naked in the house. Kale was hurting. Kale sat in that floor. I walked up to Kale and I said, what are you doing? He said, I want to give my life to Jesus. He said, I don't know where else to go. I don't know what else to do. He goes, and I kid you not, he said, you're the first person who thought of me as somebody. He said, you have given me a purpose. He stayed in that floor and cried and cried. He got up and he turned to me and like it was nothing, he said, I've given my life to Christ. I thought it was just a moment. I get to school on Monday, the next day, and it was like I had become a superhero. I walked in and all of these young men who ignored me wanted to take me to lunch. Can, I t take, can you take me to lunch? Can I come over? Can I hang with you? I said, what's going on? One young lady ran up to me and she said, we heard. K.O. gave his life to God. That young man adopted his sister's son because she was a drug addict. Got a home for his mother and him side by side. Took care of his mother to help her get off drugs. Put himself through vocational school. Ended up on the front page of the newspaper. Not one time did he call me and ask for help. Once he found his purpose, he was off. He said and believed. Tally, I believe God has a plan for my life. Every one of his friends who were in that gang, within a year and a half, were dead from gunshots, gun violence, dead. Young people, your vision's too small. Your destiny is greater than you think.